we can start, yes. So I, I'll get rid of myself, yeah? Okay. And then, so you don't see me, and then I, it will just start with yourself, yeah? Sure. Happy with that? I'm happy. Okay, so... Yeah? Greetings, everyone. Very welcome to our master class in photobiomodulation. The, this master class is run by myself. My name is Reem Hanna. I'm an associate specialist in neurosurgery at King's College Hospital in London. And I'm also an honorary associate professor at the Eastman Dental Institute at the University College London. And I have a contract as a professor at University of Genoa. And my uh, co-presenter is uh, Dr. Barabash, and he is the director of the K-Laser. The learning objective of our master class is to have a better understanding of the mechanism of action of photobiomodulation, also to appreciate the benefits of the PBM therapy in various clinical, uh, in terms of medical, veterinary, as well as in dental application, and to have an overview of the current evidence-based practice research of the PBM therapy. So the key points of the presentation, the first part that I'm gonna take care of, it's what's photobiomodulation, what you call PBM, how does it work, and the current understanding of the PBM mechanism of actions, and also the factors that play uh, an influential roles in achieving an optimal outcome of various clinical applications. And the second part of the presentations will be taken care of by Dr. Barabash. Uh, it's looking at the clinical application of PBM therapy uh, associated with evidence-based practice and literature in terms of uh, tissue repair, pain management, and also dermatological, dermatological applications. So in uh, just a disclosure that I have no actual potential uh, conflict of interest in relation to this presentation, and I have no affiliation to any companies. So what's photobiomodulation and how does it work? Before 2014, you can search the PubMed or uh, go to Google Scholar and photobiomodulation term wasn't there. All you can see is low level laser therapy, soft laser, different terms of using phototherapy. So in 2014, a group of pioneers in photobiomodulation therapy sat around a um, um, table and they tried to really conclude a better term to be given to this uh, therapy based on their uh, mechanism of actions and how it works. So they gave it a term of photobiomodulation. Photo, to break down the word, photo is light, bio is life, and modulation, you're changing the response of the molecular and cellular activities of certain molecules in the cells. So if you have um, a stress cell, so it will have more oxidative stress and less of adenosine triphosphate, which is the ATP, and adeno uh, oxidative stress lead to apoptosis of the cell. So really we are lacking of oxygenation and vascularizations of the cell itself. Shine a light of any source, as you can see with my error, that different source, I'm gonna talk about it later on in my presentation and to the mitochondria. Mitochondria is the uh, organelles that generate uh, adenosine triphosphate, the ATP, is the gas, the energy of the cells. So that would be absorbed by certain enzyme within the mitochondria and the equilibrium really will change with less oxidative stress, more ATP, and that will help to regenerate the cell. That takes me to my next cartoon that illustrates the mechanism of action of the PBM. So the light source in here could be laser or could be light emitting diode, which has a non-coherent light. This light needs to be absorbed by certain photoacceptors. And in the mitochondria, we have an enzyme called the cytochrome C oxidase, where all the photonic energy will be absorbed by this uh, enzyme, uh, which is sitting on the cell membrane of the mitochondria. As a result of that will be a cascades of cellular and molecular changes and activities resulted in 
production of the ATP, which helps into cell proliferation and differentiation. We have a reactive oxygen species is very important for uh, healing and uh, DNA at immune system. And also the nitric oxide, which is very important and uh, um, molecules in uh, as a vasodilator. So increasing the oxygenation of the cells, uh, bringing it to a more of a transport of the oxygen and enhance the immune uh, response of the cells. So this is one of the mechanisms of actions that have been there and presumed that it is for a long time. Later on, they have different uh, uh, mechanism being um, introduced to literature. I have published uh, with my colleague a paper in the cancers last year. We looked that the photobiomodulation therapies, as well as the mechanism of action, and also the role of PBM as an analgesic and healing in oral mucositis. And the professor Arani, he is a very eminent and pioneer a professor in photobiomodulation, and he used to be the president of the world. And he, there are reintroduced, there are three mechanisms of PBM photobiomodulation. One that I just described looking at the uh, photo acceptor is the cytochrome C oxidase. And there is another mechanism looking at the generative mechanism, which really the, ex the extracellular matrix and transforming growth factor beta one activation have a great role into the repair of the target tissues. And the other one is looking at the analgesic mechanism. It's very, fascinating the analgesic mechanism of PBM is still not very well understood, but at the moment, the current school is saying it's really looking at the nucleus is really playing a role in the um, understanding how the photobiomodulation can generate analgesic effects. So these are the current mechanism of actions and also there's certain um, wavelengths. They presume that the 980, the main chromoform is the water, not the cytochrome C oxidase. And also looking at the other literature talking about the 660 nanometer has nothing to do with the cytochrome C oxidase. So these are the current mechanism of actions. Uh, Professor Ranian uh, published a paper in the Journal of Dental Research looking at the, the factors that can influence the opti optimal outcome of um, any uh, clinical applications and being divided into biological one and clinical one. So the biological element is more to looking at the composition and the structure of the target tissue. If you have a skin, you're looking at the dermis, the epidermis. If you're looking at the oral cavity, looking at the oral mucosa. And all of these um, tissue structures have different chromoforms within them and different uh, consistency that where the light travels through these target tissues, some of the light might be really uh, dispersed and uh, the reaching the target tissue won't be the same photonic energy that has been uh, planned. So this is very important. This is, we cannot change this. is very um, kind of a sound or kind of evidence. However, the things that we can really help to overcome these um, biological elements is the clinical aspect of the uh, setting up the protocol of uh, photobiomodulation and that's looking at the device itself in terms of the wavelength the polarizations of the light is it linear or non-linear the coherence of the light the dose how much you're delivering to the tissue those means that the energy density which is basically how much of the photonic energy you're delivering per square centimeters on the surface area of the target tissue and also how how much of the time of the lasing and what emission mode has been delivered in terms of other factors the delivery this is in our control in setting up the clinical uh, protocol and the frequency of the treatment, the time interval, uh, that within the, um, the power of the operator. So this is how I basically uh, look at um, 
setting up the protocol of any clinical scenarios, looking first what's the diagnosis, what is it really dealing with, and then what is the treatment options and choices for the best interest of the patient and also for the, for the scenario, clinical scenarios that I'm taking care of. And then setting up this laser, I'm going to setting up the protocol and also the safety measures and then set up the treatment uh, follow-up. So the parameter, the clinical, the dose is very important. The, the power density is how much of the of what power and what uh, delivered on a square centimeters, and then the operating uh, parameters. I'm going to discuss a few of these elements which play a very influential role in uh, achieving optimal outcome. So the, 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 the graph here you see on your left hand side of the screen, it's the absorption curve is very important. And you see, you see the green, that's the optical window, which means the optical window is basically the band of the wavelengths within this uh, spectrum that, that can uh, have a great impact in producing an optimal outcome of any treatment. And that runs between 600 nanometer to 1100 or 1200 nanometer um, wavelength. And um, also looking at the light source that I described earlier on, the, the, the light source means laser. You can see there's this one strand of light has been hitting the target tissues. If you are delivering a light emitted diode, they come as a non coherent light and diffuse on a larger area. So it depends what's this clinical scenario that you want to um, uh, achieve. So you choose the light uh, source that really can uh, uh, accommodate the, the treatment plan. And some of the devices with non coherent light, like LEDs, which is light emitted diode, they have a cluster head and each cluster head deliver maybe one wavelength. Some of the devices, they have a different clusters on that head del delivering a dual wavelength or triple wavelength. So it depends what you are targeting. Uh, is it superficial tissue, deep tissue? And that really, that within the, uh, the, your, your power of the, of the clinician to choose the right light source uh, for the treatment plan. And the other things that I'd like to touch on is basically the pressure. What I mean by that, if you look at the, the, the diagram or the, the picture on your left-hand side, this is the pressure, how much of a pressure you uh, apply on the tissues that determine the depth of the penetration of the light. So the, the wavelength have a penetration depth as well as this is something within, within the clinician's uh, treatment plan to apply the, the further pressure if you want to go deeper and there further more pressure on the, on the target tissue. So you see the arrow here goes further deep into the tissue. So this is really something that you have uh, to um, apply if you want to go for a deeper target tissue with very superficial uh, wavelength. The other thing is the emission mode. They come in continuous emission mode. The majority of the diodes, uh, they come in continuous emission mode and that you're delivering it um, continuously. There's no thermal relaxation. So there's no chopping of the power output. If the power output is two watts, they're delivering it of two watts. However, you go to the gated mode, that's where the average power is half of the peak power. And there's a pulse emission mode that the, the NDAC 1064 run PBM run with a pulse uh, emission mode. The other very important things is looking at the beamer profile. I just completed my PhD last year, I defended it last year, and I looked at the photobiomodulation in uh, bone regeneration, and I looked at the beamer profile of the uh, uh, light source and looking into a Gaussian profile, the majority of the devices of the Gaussian profile and some of the devices at the moment where they come with a flat top beam profile. And what's the difference? The Gaussian profile, it used China light where the big distribution of the energy, if you look at the graph in the center, however, at the, at the periphery, it just diminishes and completely uh, kind of uh, uh, flattened. And that's like, like, like a, like really of uh, 
a hump where the, per the periphery is not getting much of the of the photonic energy. And also, if you take the distance of the beam profile from the target tissue, you are disturbing the, 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 the photonic energy. So you might really getting less than what you aiming for. If with the flat top beam profile is really the beam, the photonic energy is distributed equally over one square centimeter of the target tissue. And over the distance between the target tissue as well as the beam doesn't and disturb the, the, the consistency of the photonic energy that you're aiming to achieve. So these are quite very important things to bear in your mind. PBM therapy and application in dentistry are quite huge. It covers in terms of bone regeneration, uh, wound healing, and pain management. So that's the, the, the most um, benefits you, that we get from photobiomodulation and bone regeneration you, you can utilize in different scenarios if you have socket preservations you're doing placing an implant you can really have a photobiomodulation application if you have a huge cyst and then you want to generate a bone in the area you can use photobiomodulation and pain management in terms of the neuropathic pain uh, or a mucositis herpes and also you can use it for a wound healing, if you're having a period surgery or you trying to uh, have a wound and then you want to uh, achieve a wound healing can accelerate it with photobiomodulation. So my, my in summary, photobiomodulation is very useful tool, non-invasive effective treatment modality to relieve pain as well as for tissue regeneration. And its mechanism of action uh, at the moment are evolving to have a better understanding that help us to achieve better outcome. And also uh, you need to have a good understanding of the influencing factors and how you can uh, overcome that one uh, is very crucial. And also to bear in mind that photobiomodulation therapy is a dose dependent. So that's very important and very challenging element of photobiomodulation. And there's a lot of well-designed controlled human studies have really covered various clinical application in dentistry, in medical science, as well as in veterinary. With this, I would like to thank you for listening. And there's a few of the papers that I uh, placed over there to have a look at it. So now I will give the, the floor to my uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Aravesh, to go with the second part of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Reem. Uh, as ever, a very good, insightful uh, lecture in regards to photobiomodulation. Um, could you, yeah, allow me access, thank you. Um, so the second part of this, uh, is going to be uh, about some of the clinical aspects about it um, uh, and tie in the aspects that um, Reem was just talking about. So um, thank you, Reem, uh, for letting us speak at the meeting today, uh, as well as the BMLA. Um, and hopefully this will uh, be of interest to all the audience. Um, so my conflicts of interest, uh, I am a director of VBS Direct, which uh, does sell uh, a laser into the veterinary uh, universities, hospitals, and clinics across the UK and Ireland. Um, and uh, in the UK and Ireland, I also distribute under VBS Medical, a human uh, therapeutic laser um, called K-Laser, um, as well as a K-Laser Blue into the aesthetic market. Um, so as Reem was saying, uh, uh, we're using light energy to uh, um, stimulate uh, living tissues, and in this case, obviously, the human uh, and animal body, um, and all uh, laser light through photobiomodulation. Some will be reflected depending on the wavelength, some will be scattered, uh, and uh, some will reach its target molecule within the body system. Um, for myself, I, 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 um, the lasers I work with work targeting water, um, melanin in the skin, uh, copper, cytochrome, C and then hemoglobin, the iron. Um, and these are the chromophores that we target um, through uh, the use of four different wavelengths. One, a class 3B in the 660, uh, then a class 4 uh, um, in the 800, 905, and 970, um, and trying to get peak absorption of cytochrome C, oxyhemoglobin, 
um, and water for perfusion, um, but then in the skin, we're trying to do both cytochrome C and melanin in the skin. Um, the, uh, there are lots of different classes of lasers, which obviously the BMLA will be well aware of. Um, and in the case of um, uh, the lasers I work with are in uh, uh, class 3B for the skin and then maybe class 4 for the um, deeper tissues in order to do things efficiently and, and rapidly within that short time frame. Um, again, uh, from the dermatologists in the skin and, and uh, some of the plastic surgeons, you may be using both class 3B and class 4. Um, but really, if you're trying to do uh, deep tissues um, in a biologically um, a correct way and in a short time frame, then a, a class four laser does allow you that within a short time frame and within the clinic. Um, and it's a composite of both the time, the power and the wavelength that allows you to do the whole myriad of different um, clinical factors that we're trying to look to uh, achieve within our medical clinics. Um, we've done some work in Marburg and in Trieste University, and we've shown with um, maybe an 800 wavelength that depending on the different cell lines, um, smooth muscle in this case, when you have high frequency pulsing, you seem to stimulate better cell growth, where when you have continuous, you get more leukocytic, uh, white blood cell growth. Um, at lower frequency, under 200 hertz, we seem to get a much better osteoblast and uh, uh, cartilage growth. Uh, and around 500 to 2,000, we seem to get more new blood vessel growth through endothelial cells. Um, uh, uh, the, the actual aspects of pain management, uh, as uh, Reem was elucidating, that there are some really profound analgesics um, uh, effects, and we're learning more and more about it. But in the case of uh, just improving perfusion to and from maybe a damaged tissue or a joint, uh, and opening up those capillary beds, we can improve that affect and reduce edema and swelling. Um, uh, not that they're used often in this way, but if you run a, a therapeutic laser that's able to penetrate down to the transmembrane proteins, you can have a similar temporary effect like a local anesthetic and a steroid. Um, but if you are able to go and target the central nervous system and target the cell bodies, both in the dorsal root ganglion and in the spinal column, uh, then you can have some really profound effects in regards of neuroplasticity, uh, extensions of dendritic outsprouting, and, and reductions in apoptosis, which is important. Um, overall, when we're looking at the clinical effects of them, we're trying to improve metabolic activity safely. Um, we're able to improve the vascularity um, short-term-wise, just general perfusion, opening capillary beds, but long-term wise, we can also stimulate the growth factors to go and improve new vascularization um, due, to the va due to the better perfusion. And we can reduce some of the uh, inflammatory cytokines and reduce the swelling. Um, chronically, we can go and improve some of the um, white blood cell activity um, and anti-inflammatory. And then for good therapy lasers, we're able to penetrate down into the spinal column and to the dorsal root ganglion and over a chronic use, uh, we can improve not only the motor, but also the sensory function. Um, and we can reduce cell death um, and improve the connectivity between different cell lines. Um, and this can have quite a profound analgesic effect. Overall, a good uh, therapy laser, whether it's targeting the skin or much deeper tissue, will improve the uh, tissue repair by about 30%. Um, and what's nice about the uh, improvement is you tend to go and get minimal scarring. So you sort of type one collagen and good elastin, and therefore tendons, ligaments, other muscular structures will heal better and faster. Um, lasers take longer for breaking down fibrous tissue. Um, and that's because they're working on the immunoregulation aspects about it. Um, things like shockwave are better at breaking scar tissue. Uh, it takes longer with a laser. Um, but obviously, both a class 3B and a class 4, uh, using the correct wavelengths, will be able to accelerate wound healing and, uh, and stimulate acupuncture points. So it, it lasers really can be used on a very diverse route from chronic pain to dental, as Doreen was saying, to musculoskeletal regeneration, to neurological problems, and also things like podiatry and aesthetics. Um, we ourselves work with elite sports, um, and the beauty is if you use it quick enough and early enough, you can get extremely good quality of healing 
and therefore these athletes are able to return back to uh, as close as they were prior to injuries or, or get them back quicker so they have less downtime. Um, and myself, I also work in the veterinary field. So um, some of the beauty about being using lasers is uh, you're able to treat from a horse to an exotic uh, um, and uh, um, in short time frames, especially with the class four laser, have that capabilities. Okay, so I'll look at briefly through some scientific uh, papers. Obviously for the lake of this, it will be very short. Um, starting superficially, um, this is a, a nice study using an 820 nanometer, eight joules per centimeter squared. These were 22-year-old uh, physio students going through college who donated uh, a, a forearm punch biopsy on both arms. Um, and they had uh, standard silver white dressing uh, on one arm with laser, uh, no dressing with laser, and then treated with the silver white dressing uh, with no laser, no treatment, no laser. And you can see by day 20, they've all uh, uh, healed, but there is an acceleration of about 30% with the, uh, which was significant in the two laser groups compared to the others. And myself and colleagues have done some work with Bristol University, where we looked at laparoscopic ovary wounds. Um, and when we were looking at the combination of four wavelengths in this case, and the power of about 10 joules, 100 joules, sorry, we were able to get down to zero infectivity in enterococcus. And when we looked at the actual biological in vivo aspect, we halved the asepsis score, so the less inflammation, faster healing, less infection on the skin, even compared to standard uh, sterile scenarios. What was interesting is when we found the optimum uh, um, uh, ability to go and uh, improve the skin healing and reduce infection, when we took away a wavelength, in this case, a uh, 905 on the left, you can see the infectivity on the, of the enterococcus increases. Um, and again, on the right-hand side, you can see when we took away the 660, the infectivity uh, and the amount of enterococcus uh, was increased when we took away one of those wavelengths. So there seemed to be a degree of synergism happening there. Um, blood flow is, is probably one of the most important aspects of good quality lasers. Um, and what you're looking at here is four different groups of rats, which had uh, a, a suture um, and uh, had a, a, a cut of their underbelly and then resutured. Um, and what you're looking at on group A is the placebo group and the flap survival in millimeter squared. The B is just lasering the iliolumbar blood vessel and the C and the D is the proximal and distal. And what you can see there is just going and improving perfusion to that tissue was as good as lasering directly the actual tissues itself. And all three were significantly better than not lasering. And we've done some work in humans looking at uh, uh, the enhancement uh, um, and reduction of ischemia and hypoxia and accelerated healing. Um, this was a case of uh, a double blind randomized crossover over four days. On average, they were 20, almost 21 year old students uh, with no history of illness. Um, and on day one, one, some of the group were doing sham, some were doing one watt, three watt or six watts, and it was measured over a formal minute period using plesmography to go and measure the blood flow on their forearms. Um, over this period of time, they showed that uh, uh, there was a greater phonic energy in a shorter time frame um, with no appreciable rise in tissue temperature, uh, which um, hypothesized that you, there was an important in regards of healing deeper tissues. Um, and uh, the, uh, the uh, authors said improved circulation is probably one of the laser's greatest contributions to soft tissue healing. Um, and it appeared to be dose dependent. So the higher the dose, the longer the uh, um, length of blood flow um, improvements were, um, and also the more profound the overall intensity of the um, improvements in perfusion happened. And we've used this uh, in Guy's and St. Thomas's and other hospitals around the UK, both on um, hand injuries, um, where we're treating and improving perfusion and uh, uh, lymphatics to the whole of the lower arm or the lower leg, um, and then treating with high intensity um, uh, pulsed phases over the actual soft tissue injuries, whether that's a carpal tunnel or in this case, a, a, a soft tissue injury. Um, we've done similar work on diabetic foot ulcers, 
Um, this individual on the left uh, uh, on the 22nd of May um, had pretty poor circulation and he had amputations of his lower feet um, and toes. And what you can see over the course of uh, um, several months, uh, it was a diminishing overall picture. Um, uh, and you can see how that um, uh, occurred in, in a, a reduction in blood flow, especially you can see on the uh, right leg there. This was a picture in May um, uh, when we first saw the patients. Unfortunately, we were not allowed to treat them for several months. Um, but over the six weeks, we were allowed to, uh, we were able to achieve, despite diminishing core blood flow, an improvement and uh, uh, a healing of the actual area of the amputations. Um, other studies have looked at blood flow in diabetics. And here you can see over 20 minutes and over 40 minutes, an improvement with the laser blood flow compared to the placebo. And even when you turn the laser off, it continues to go and improve over um, the next 15 odd minutes that this was study was looked at. The crux of that is that when you're looking at healing in the diabetics, uh, which is the group two versus the placebo in group one, same podiatrist, same uh, medical drug treatments, you can see that there was a, a, a very defined improvement in healing and in granulation of the diabetics um, at three joules per centimeter squared um, using two wavelengths in this case. Um, we did some work in uh, guys in St. Thomas's um, and that allowed us to um, uh, look over a 12 week period um, treating once to twice a week using all four wavelengths and on average like that arm study doing the majority of the um, energy over the lower leg to improve perfusion and lymphatics and then using lower power and high intensity over the wound itself. Um, during the study we healed 80% of the non-healing wounds which were three-year-old ulcers, 0% um, healed in the placebo group and on average these wounds healed in about 4.6 weeks. And this is an example of it. So you can see this person on the left foot. Um, within three sessions, uh, we healed uh, the ulcer, which was a chronic ulcer. And this guy had an identical uh, um, wound on his uh, left foot. Um, and you can see with no laser uh, over the 12 week period, there was no healing. In fact, it got slightly larger. Um, from a musculoskeletal point of view, there are some calcanean studies. This is a rat study um, where um, they use the control group and a control with crushing in this device with no laser. And then they crushed the other 42 rats and lasered either three, five or seven days consecutively. On day eight, they looked histologically at the calcanean tendon and you can see the damaged, crushed, uh, uh, very poorly uh, healed uh, non-laser group at the top compared to the day five group below where there is very nice symmetry, uh, very little inflammation and good alignment of the uh, collagen fibers um, to the extent that the histologist could not tell the difference between the day five group and the control non-damaged. From a human perspective, when we look at 52 people with chronic tendinopathies uh, using eccentric exercises and placebo laser, versus eccentric exercises and uh, uh, a 820 laser. Um, you can see they did 12 sessions um, using visual analog scores and a number of different scoring systems on pain and uh, functionality. And on all cases, there was a very significant improvement on the addition of the uh, laser to the eccentric exercises. Graphically, you can see that quite clearly here from four, eight and 12 weeks. The top line being the, um, uh, the, the placebo, the bottom line being the laser eccentric groups. Um, and then you can also see the improvements in the stiffness in the morning and the improvements in dorsiflexion. So on all accounts, positive benefits. Um, there have been a few uh, meta-analyses. It's very difficult to do meta-analysis on laser because of the variety and the differences between different lasers. Um, but they looked at about 4,000 papers here. 25 of them were true randomized double-blind RCT studies. Um, 12 of the studies uh, showed a very positive effect versus placebo, and 13 were inconclusive or no effect versus placebo. And the consistency was the higher power on the positive studies 
um, uh, the 12 positive studies, whether it was epicondylitis, Achilles tendinopathy, there's a whole range of different aspects. From an osteoarthritis point of view, uh, lasers are able to reduce the pain, the localized inflammation and swelling, um, and therefore hopefully improve the range of motion and uh, it, it overall uh, 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 musculoskeletal. And they can do this via the reduction in the inflammatory cytokines and white blood cells. Um, and they can stimulate both articular cartilage and other soft tissue. Um, and if you're working centrally, uh, um, you can work on the nerve function as well as some of the nerve receptors and improvements in synovial fluids. Um, this study here, high dose, uh, 48 joules per centimeter squared um, with about 10 watts um, uh, used, uh, 8.30 twice a week for four weeks. And you can see the gray placebo versus the laser on the left-hand side, there was about 71% less pain with the laser, um, both post-treatment and at two weeks. And then the uh, two months, a month off the laser, you can see there was a slight increase in pain, but really not very much. Similarly, on the joint flexion, there was an improvement in that over that two-week period. And then at two months, a slight drop-off um, with nothing being used. Um, lasers themselves um, can work locally on the nose receptors. They can work on the peripheral nerve itself, but they can also work on the spinal nerves and the dorsal root ganglion, especially the cell bodies, which obviously have the metabolic activity. Um, and here again, you can just see we can work both in the noxus stimuli, the dorsal root ganglion cells, as well as the spinal nerves as well. Um, um, there are some very good studies out there looking at placebo versus laser group. And um, this is a rat study, um, which showed a uh, significantly higher size of the neurons and a, a improvement in interconnectivity and dendritic outsprouting. Um, this is also a sciatic nerve study looking at action potentials running along the sciatic nerve. They crushed the sciatic nerve, but they lasered over the lumbosacral nerve roots supplying the sciatic nerve. And that is the dark dots. Um, and you can see the top line is the non-damaged uh, placebo group, which consistently stayed high throughout the 180 days. The dark dots show that when you laser the spinal nerves, you can improve the sciatic nerve function. And the, the crushed non-lasered is the bottom line, which consistently stayed low throughout the whole of the 180 day period. Um, we did a study on uh, 70 females. It's a double blind placebo crossover study. These women had uh, uh, oncological problems uh, and the chemotherapy had damaged their spine um, in treating the uh, different types of bowel, ovary, uh, uterine and cervical cancers. Um, and uh, we used on average about 10,000 joules over their lower spine and their uh, legs and the peripheries, um, varying from about 6.75 to 12 watts average, peaking at 20 watts. Um, importantly, there was no complications. We didn't cause any damage to the individuals, um, but there was a very profound reduction um, and a low toxicity treatment in reducing and improving the peripheral neuropathies and their ability to perceive normal pain. Um, and uh, uh, they extrapolated that it was down to reduced apoptosis and uh, neurite outgrowths. Um, one area where we've got nice approval is the use uh, on post-oncology cases. Um, this is an early study we did in 2016 on rats. Um, and we found that with melanomas and carcinoma in the rat, we didn't increase the tumor progression, which was very surprising. Um, but what we were able to do is stimulate the immune system to attack the cancer with the T lymphocytes, dendritic cells, and type 1 interferon. Um, and conversely, we reduced the angiogenic macrophages that were feeding the blood vessels to keep the growth of the cancer. As it says, it was a striking and unexpected result and potentially an emerging strategy for tumor progression and reduction. Um, they went on in Italy to go and do some work on children which had squamous cell carcinoma of the mouth. And as a side effect of the chemotherapy, they get mucositis. Um, and here you can see over 11 days using uh, K laser in this case, they have no side effects, but we significantly reduced the uh, lips, the mucosa, uh, swelling and uh, improved swallowing in saliva and tongue control. You can see the lesions here 
um, and over the 11 day period, the, the clear up of all the lesions within the mouth of these children. And this went on to a much bigger 10 dental hospital randomized controlled RCT double blind study on 51 children with K-Laser, 50 without, all of which had squamous cell carcinoma of the mouth. They used a, an oral mucosa score done by the WHO. Um, and you can see the differences between the sham and the K-Laser. Uh, there was a very significant difference and this led to the uh, nice endorsement of uh, its use. In summary, uh, as uh, uh, Reem showed, power, wavelength and pulse frequency work in unison um, and they can reduce pain, swelling and accelerate healing. Um, a wide range of clinical applications. I think we're on the cusp of something very big um, in regards of lasers and their therapeutic use, both post-surgery and in pain management um, and for medical treatments. Um, and there is a very wide range of use, uh, either alone or in unison with other modalities for soft tissue accelerated healing, bone and cartilage, neurological, anti-inflammatory, chronic pain, and also immune modulation. Um, thank you for um, listening. And if you are interested, uh, we can offer demos. Um, I very much appreciate your attendance and I'm sure Reem and I now will be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much.